And I walked in the door, Jelly Bean was sitting there, and Jelly Bean was six four, six five. And wears a hat a lot of time. Yeah, and make him look like he's seven foot, you know. Right. And he just stood up right before I got in and said, Hey, you Ronnie Baker Brooks? I said, Yeah, Jelly Bean Johnson. And to be honest with you, Joe, I was so caught up in seeing Albert Collins, <laughs> it didn't even ring Jelly Bean Johnson. I'm thinking because he was so big and he had on a uh, Vikings, Minnesota Vikings jersey. I'm thinking he's a football player. <laughs> <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> Welcome to another edition of Musicians Reveal with Joe Kelly. We are awful excited today because one of my longtime friends has a new record out. He's really excited about it. We've been playing tracks as soon as we got a little advanced copy from it. He hails from Chicago, Illinois, amazing guitarist, hails also from blues family, blues in his DNA. His father, Lonnie Brooks, longtime blues great, and his brother, Wayne Baker Brooks, I know a few of his other family members have uh, musical talent as well. I think he told me his sister sings as well. Yeah. But uh, haven't talked to Ronnie in a, in a few years since the pandemic started, but I'm yeah. really excited to welcome my great friend, Ronnie Baker Brooks. Thank you, Joe. Thank you for having me back, man, on, on the show, man. It's, I miss you, brother. <laughs> yeah, I miss seeing you. The last, the last time I saw you was, uh, I think, at the Westport Blues in Connecticut. Yeah, that was, that was, that was a while, while ago. Yeah, I still got some video clips. If I could maybe put a couple in this interview, so. Yeah. Yeah, that, that I had the horns time. with me then, right? Yeah, you did. You did. Yeah. The Uptown Horns set in with me at that gig, I believe. Yeah, they did. Yeah. I remember yeah. you told me you were switching on and off. Yeah. Who was gonna, uh, perform and, and such like that. Yeah, man. It's good to yeah. see you. Yeah. Great, great to see you and talk with you. And uh, let's talk about this record, which is on the prestigious Alligator Records, which I know you guys have been dancing for a long time together and your father was on the label. Yeah. Um, what was the decision to join up with the, with the big label? Well, you know, during the pandemic, man, I had a time to think, Joe. I had a lot of time. And you, you, you didn't know what was going to happen when it first, you know, unleashed on us. And it, I, had, I hit a reset button because this was the first time I had to deal with something this, of this major um, level without my father. You know, right. you norm normally I would have my father to, to, you know, bounce off of or get suggestions or, or see how he would react or someone to 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 relate to that could, re you know, I could trust that, you know what I mean? And mm -hmm. he was gone, man. And so I had to I had to do it myself. You know, I had my mom still. Right. But right. I'm talking about from the business standpoint of being, a, you know, a musician and all that. And, and uh and I had to, I had time to think, and I started doing these Facebook live shows every Friday. Yeah, that was great. Yeah, yeah. And so I started doing um, some of my father material that I'd never done before ever. And I was like, man, a lot of the first things that I've done, like the first album I played on, was on Alligator Records. Uh, okay. Yep. The first record I ever sang on was on Alligator Records. The first song I ever wrote that got published or, you know, performed on was on a record was on Alligator. Like, man, there's a lot of stuff there. And I started thinking about um, the platform that my father built along with Alligator that allowed me to grow. Hmm. And and uh, my manager, John Bonsamino, was like, hey, man, I've been talking to Bruce Iglar at, at, at Alligator, man. I think we should set up a meeting. You know, what you think? You know, and I, I, I never really 
in the beginning of my career, I thought about it. But after I got Watchdog Records started, my own label started, Watchdog Records, I, I didn't think about, uh, you know, any other label, to be honest, uh, until uh, the time the Change album came out. Mm -hmm. and and uh and that kind of opened the door to to me thinking different too you know when i did the times to change album and um with steve jordan so i said yeah man i told my manager yeah set it up man let's see let's see where it goes you know let's see where it goes and, and uh he set up the meeting with bruce the president the founder of uh, alligator and uh bruce said some things to me man that he had never said before mm -hmm. He had talked about my dad and said some things be, to me that I, he had never said before. And he was, very, you know, during that time, everybody was in, in, a, in the pandemic. We were kind of, you know, we didn't know what was unknown. It was unknown. Mm -hmm. And I think, he, you know, he felt like he needed to tell me these things because I felt that it was sincere. Right. And I was like, wow, let me think about this. You know, and prior to that, I went to my mom at the time. My mom was ill. Mm -hmm. And she was battling her, you know, things with her health. And, and uh, I said, Mom, you know, they're trying to set up a meeting with me and Bruce from Alligator. What you think? She said, I think you should do it. At least listen to him and, and see what he got to say. Mm -hmm. and, you know, and I did it, man. He said what he said to me. And I was like, man, OK. And we set up another meeting. And then uh, I decided to do it. I decided to do it because I can't change what happened in the past, mm -hmm. but I can change what happens in, you know, presently. Right. Right. I don't know what's going to happen in the future, but I can, I can change what happens right now, you know? And, right, um, right. and when we decided to do it, I said, Bruce, let's, I know you love this music because he's been putting out the blues what 54 years or so, 53 years or so. Yeah. And I was a big part of the early, I mean, you know, the middle part of that, you know, with my dad. My dad was important, the very beginning of it. Right. And I, I came in on the middle end of it and I, I went away, you know, and then I came back and uh, I said, man, I know you love this music because you worked very hard mm -hmm. at, at what you've done and you built a, a, a strong legacy. Let's make a record for the love of the blues. Yeah, he said, he said yes, and and he he suggested the producer Jim Gaines, and Jim Gaines produced Santana, Stevie Ray Vaughan, Luther Allison, Lonnie Brooks, and a bunch of other greats. Uh, even you know, uh, 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 several other uh, Steve Miller, uh, several other rock groups. You know, yeah, Hue Huey Lewis in the News, and wow, and yeah, he's got a strong. Um, you know, track record, man. And uh, I had worked with Jim Gaines on my dad's record, Roadhouse Rules. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was like, yeah, let's do it. And man, and here we are, man. And uh, I know a lot of the staff there at Alligator for years because, you know, my father had been there for so long. And, and some of them that's still there today, I grew up with. <laughs> right. Yeah. You still know, doing it. <laughs> they're still doing it. I'm still doing it. Right. And right. They, 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 they were coming to my shows, man, when they found out we were talking, they were like really excited. Like, Ronnie, I think this, is, this would be really good, man. I think you should, you know, think about it, you know. And so the excitement started building, man. And, and I just went in the studio. I, I presented before I got to the studio, I presented 30 original tracks to, to Alligator. Um, cause I had time to write songs during the pandemic. Yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> and man, the hardest part, Joe, well, one of the hardest parts was um, breaking down the thirty songs to the eleven that we have. Yeah, what, what, you know, what is that process? You got all that music? Do you do it yourself, or you got a little round table, or the band, or the producer? I started with a round table. Mm -hmm. Uh, it was Alligators, Tim, Tim um, that works for the uh, radio department, and Bruce, okay. and my manager, John. We had the first couple of meetings. And then I got a couple of friends, my friend Gus Taylor, that I played with uh, my dad back in the day. I was in a band with him. He was very influential in my growth as a, a band member, you know, and I trust him. And uh, I shared some of the songs with him and, and I was just bouncing off people. But ultimately, Joe, it, it came down to me to decide on what I felt and, and what I what I had to do 
because I was taking what they was liking, and I'm like, okay, yeah, I can hear that, and I can hear that. And then, I, to be honest, no one knew what I was going to record until I got to, to Memphis. I recorded in, uh, outside of outside of Memphis with Jim Gaines at his house. Oh, okay. He's got a home studio that his wife, they, uh, she grew up in his house, and they made it a studio. And uh, I got down there, man. I had I had about... I got it down to about 20 to 15. <laughs> <laughs> you had a ways to go still. <laughs> and when I got down there, man, we drove from Chicago because I, I had my, my bus. I had to take all my gear down there. Mm -hmm. And uh, we drove through me and my man Scooter. You remember Scooter used to drive for me? Yeah, yeah. I, yeah, I don't know him as much as Rico, but I know Scooter, yeah. Yeah, Rico. Well, he took over after Rico passed away. Okay. And, uh, me and him drove from Chicago to Memphis, man, in a, in a rainstorm, a sleet storm, man. Wow. The day before my birthday <laughs> in January, man. Wow. And I'm I'm really, like, thinking about the songs on the way down there with all this gear in the back. And, and uh, when I got to the hotel, I called my manager. I said, man, I got my list. And we went in and did it. Wow. What, what's it about uh, Memphis? I know you're the producer. You know, it's out of his home. Obviously, it's 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 good you work out of his place. But what's special about recording down in that area of the country? I, you know, I, the the idea of getting away from home. Oh, okay, yeah. And where I can just focus on that, what I'm doing. You know, I know the distraction. I mean, when I'm home, I can do that as well. But then you come home, I got distractions. Well, you know, family stuff. Not not not. I, I don't mean that in the, a distraction way, but right things that take priority over, over what I'm doing at the time. Right. And my family is first priority, you know? And right. so getting away, going to, to do that only, it gives me a focus level that's, that's, you know, I'm, I'm more comfortable with. And, um, I just love, I love the, the vibe down there. Um, I've recorded all my records down there. Yeah. You know, but I do want to do one here in Chicago. I got the rhyme beat in the paper When I steal old John T. Now look at him. Pictures of everything and you can order it. The official release date, I believe, is October 7th, right? October 11th. 11th, okay. October 11th. Yeah. And you, you did a uh, signing already of a yeah. record release. Now, now tell us about that. I came in at the end, but what, what was that about? It looked pretty cool. Well, the cool thing about being with Alligator also is they right here in Chicago. Right. They got the warehouse here, the office is here. Now um, I can go up there and they ask me to come up and sign. What they're doing on their website, this, the first 300 CDs pre-ordered get this autographed CD. Okay. And then the first 100 albums get the uh, signed album. And they asked me to come up there and do that. Excuse me, and I went up there to do that, man, and that brought back so many memories because I had, excuse me, I hadn't been in the warehouse in a long time. I've been to the office, you know, we were having meetings at the office, mm -hmm. and that brought back a lot of memories. But when I went in that warehouse, like, whoa, man, I hadn't been there in a long time. And it brought back a lot of memories. And uh, meeting the, the, uh, the staff that was there, man, uh, Bill, he'd been there head of the warehouse for 50 years. Wow. <laughs> He's got some stories. And man, we look. I'm looking in the place. We used to rehearse there. Mm -hmm. We used to rehearse for records. You know, like whenever my dad was doing a record, we would rehearse mm -hmm. there. We rehearsed for tours there. I wrote the song like Father Like Son there mm -hmm. with Bruce. We wrote okay. that song together right there at the warehouse. Um, a lot of memories, man. Work, playing with Coco Taylor, you know, oh man. And I was like, it just brought back a lot of memories. And I thought it was cool to be there. I said, you know what? I should go live. And yeah, live yeah. And, and, and we did the CD and uh, album autograph in live. Wow. So that's, you got, you, this is the busy time, the record's recording, but, um, you know, promotion, I'm sure you'll be all over the place if not already. But uh, yeah. what about, uh, you live for the stage, so what, what's the early plans for for dates coming up? That for, well, for I'm, uh, my CD release party, the CD, the album comes out October 11th worldwide. 
okay. all platforms everywhere. Mm -hmm. uh, that's the one thing cool about Alligator. When I was doing Watchdog stuff, I would come out whenever <laughs> I come to your town. <laughs> yeah, Rakaya, right? Rakaya and Lee, yeah, yeah. Right, right. Shout out to Lee. You know, Rakaya passed away. Oh, uh, really? Okay. Oh, I yeah. didn't know. Wow. God rest her soul. But um, uh, yeah, it comes out worldwide October 11th. October 18th, I'm doing an uh, album release party here in Chicago at, uh, well, outside of Chicago in Berwyn. Illinois mm -hmm. at a place called Fitzgerald's. I, okay. I used to play there a lot, many years. Matter of fact, I used to play there with my dad for many years. It's kind of like a well-known venue here. And then I hit the road. I uh, go up to Detroit the next day, or the Detroit area. I'm playing at the Token Lounge on the 19th of October in Westland, uh, Michigan. And then we come home and head to the Blues Cruise. I do the blues oh, okay. cruise. Yeah, you've done that a few times, right? Yeah, man. Yeah. We're having this uh, album release party on the cruise. Oh, wow. And then when I get off the cruise, I go to Europe. And I don't know if you remember um, this video that went viral of this 12-year-old kid playing the guitar. Yeah, yeah, the yeah. Movie. I remember that, yeah. That was with me, man. I know, I know. Well, a lot of people didn't know because they kind of cut me out of it, you know. Yeah. <laughs> but that was Toby Lee. Wow. And that was taken at the the Den in Denmark at the uh, Blues Heaven Festival. Is that the and one I'm, on the water? No, no it's no, in, no. it's inside a venue. Okay, uh, the one we did. Uh, I've done it several times, and I'm I'm going back there in November. And then when I get back from Denmark, we hitting the road. I'm coming to East Coast, man. I'm doing some dates with uh, my my friend Coco Montoya. Oh yeah, and so yeah, we, you know we we um moved out of Connecticut. We're in Saratoga Springs now, New York. Oh, okay. So remember, remember you and Sh uh, Shamika played Albany outside the Blues Festival? Yeah, Albany. yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm 20 minutes north of there, so I... Okay. Yeah, so hopefully you get up here. Yeah, I got dates, man. All of my dates are on my website, RonnieBakerBrooks.com. Mm -hmm. Okay. And uh, we're building a new website, and uh, I got new merchandise. I got a new record. I'm coming back on yeah. the road, Joe. Yeah. I mean, I'm going to tell our, our viewers, listeners, if you haven't seen Ronnie Baker Brooks perform in person, just go to YouTube. There's amazing performances. <laughs> this, this brother lives for the stage. There's no doubt about that. I mean, you, you just have that connection with, with your audience, even if they haven't seen you. you I know, love people, you know, man. Yeah. You know, and if I can make them happy, I love seeing people happy, first of all. Mm -hmm. And if I can make them happy playing music, it's double the pleasure. And, you know, I, I it's been a while, you know, when Times of Change came out, it was a crazy time in my life. That was in uh, 2017, it came out. We actually started recording it in 2013. But, you know, like we were, I, I didn't want to put it out on Watchdog because I wanted to find a label that fit what we were trying to do and we even presented it to uh alligator and at the time they was like uh you know they did they they wasn't feeling it as far as uh the format of what they're doing what they were doing at the time and uh so we we got with mascot and mascot put it out man and, and that was in 2017 man i turned 50 that year my father was sick i had to take care of my father here at my home wow he eventually passed away unfortunately this one year uh my daughter graduated from school my wife graduated from college she got her uh, degree in, in nursing mm -hmm. we got married wow. my sister passed away my sister was the one you was talking about jackie she uh put out a gospel cd Oh, she passed. Yeah. She passed. She oh, wow. passed. She okay. helped me start. She helped me get Watchdog Records started with my mother. Okay. And then my mother fell ill. It was a crazy time, man. I had some like high highlights and some low lights in my life. Wow. And I wasn't on the yeah. road, man. I, I didn't. I didn't go on the road for a while, you know. So I am really looking forward to coming back out there. Yeah. Now you're kind of like okay. Things are yeah. focused. I mean, I, I, all the stuff that you mentioned are life things we all go through, but to be on the road away from things you need to take care of it must be real tough. So, yeah. 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 It, it was it was tugging at my heart because I was doing some some dates and, you know, we kept we kept my father illness private within, within the family. 
Okay. And um, I didn't want to lie to the people. They're like, how's Lonnie doing? I, I would always say he's hanging in there. You know, I wasn't lying, yeah, but he was right. he wasn't able to be out there on the road anymore. And and he was here at our home, man. I mean, I really had to take care of my dad, and it was an honor that he trusted me to come here with me and my wife, Sandy, and um, to to allow us to be there for him, man. And, um, and I, I I'm I'm very um, grateful that God allowed me to do that because I had some great conversations with my dad before he died. Right, right. Some man to man. It, it it was weird, Joe. All my life, my dad. Remember that image of a kid walking with his dad in the rain, and dad got the umbrella. Yeah, yeah. And the kid holding on to his coat, and he protecting yeah, yeah. him from the rain. Right, right. That was me with my father, even when I was grown. Wow. You know, that's that's how much of a hero he 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 was to me, and he is to me, and. When he moved over here with us before he got sick, that's that role started changing. He started depending on me more and more and more. So eventually he had to depend on me totally. Right, right. And and during that during that transition, man, he was giving me stuff, man. He was giving me nuggets, man, on life. And like he, he even told me, like, man, if something happens to me, if you able, continue playing. Cause that's the best thing for you. That's the best thing to get you through it, you know. And it so happened, he passed the week I had two two shows to do. Here, one was here in Chicago, and one was in uh, South Bend, Indiana. And I was contemplating on can canceling it. I mean, he died that Saturday, and I had another. I had a gig on that Friday, upcoming Friday and Saturday, and I was like, man, I I, I couldn't sleep for like two days, man. Right, right. And and I, I know I'm babbling, but... No, keep on babbling. <laughs> okay, okay. So I'm going to tell you what happened. After he passed, I couldn't sleep for like two days, man. I mean, literally. I was up mm -hmm. for like two, three days, man. Right. And I, I remember it was like four o'clock in the morning. And I'm just spinning, right? I said, oh, man, I didn't take my garbage out front. It's garbage pickup day. Mm -hmm. And I'm still contemplating on... Am I going to play or not? And I, they waiting on me to give them the answer, man. And I'm trying to set up the arrangements and all this stuff going on. And I go outside. To, it's 4 o'clock in the morning. It's pitch dark. They said the darkest hours just before dawn. And it was pitch dark, man. And I took my garbage out front. And then right when I was walking back to my home, a bird flew at me. And I was like, whoa. And the bird... <laughs> flew up to the tree and I could, I could see the bird, you know, mm -hmm. and just start whistling real loud, like he was upset. And I said, dad, is that you? And right when I said that, Joe, another bird came, ran that bird out of the tree mm -hmm. and sat there and looked at me. And at that moment, I felt, you know, like someone poured some warm water. Right, right on the top of my head and it was a soothing effect that came over me and I heard my dad's voice say Ronnie go in the house and get some sleep wow. now yeah. and do your show and then I yeah. went in the house went to bed I called him the next day and I said I'm doing the show mm -hmm. we had the show man I told my brother to come down Wayne and I'm going to tell you, that was the best thing I could have done because I got all of those emotions out. Right. And I began my process. And, yeah. and I, I suggest that to any of the musicians out there that really loves this music, love music. The music is a healer. The music is a healer, man. I remember uh, when John Blackwell, drummer with Prince, his daughter drowned in a swimming pool while they were on the musicology tour they took one yeah. date off and he came back and they resumed the tour like a couple of days after and i always thought wow how can you how can you do it but you you mentioned it's a healer yeah it it's hard you know to get to that place to think that way but once you do it i'm telling you man for me it was the best thing i could hear my dad's voice man go and play because when you know when Rico, you remember my driver Rico, yeah, yeah, great guy. Yeah. When he died, man, 
I, we we were um, in San Diego, and he didn't show up for the for the flight. And when I got off the plane, they said, "Oh, they found him dead in his house, man." And I was like, "Ah, oh, I was so messed up, man. I didn't know what to do, man." I called Jelly Bean. And I, was, right. I was talking to Jelly Bean, man. And then I called my dad, and my dad would just talk me through it. I'm in the cab headed to the hotel. I said, "Man, I I, I don't know if I could do this." He said, "No, get to the hotel, son." And I got to the hotel. I left the cab. I left my guitar in the cab, man. Wow. And I'm checking in at the hotel. The honest cab driver came to me and said, sir, you forgot this. And at that moment, I could hear Rico saying, play. Play tonight. Yeah. And, and talk, my dad talked me down. Man. He said, man, you are, you're there. He said, you, you can't fly back. It, it was the club owner. He, he hired me for a private party for his birthday. So he had mm -hmm. all this planned. Right. So I didn't even tell him about it. I didn't even say nothing to the club owner about it. And he said, you got to do it, man. Go and play. Because you're going to sit in that room and just bounce off the walls. And sure enough, I go and play. It was the best thing I, I could do for me to get through the process. And that's why I always say, man, um, the music, when I play, I, I try to give it all to the people because I know the power of the music. I know what it can do because uh, I know what it does for me. Yeah, I mean, R Rico has such a great sense of humor i remember being on your tour bus before you were playing a gig in manchester yeah. new hampshire and it, people were cracking on because he was saying the word paparazzi <laughs> paparazzi <laughs> and you guys were having a blast <laughs> but that, yeah and they had a debate i think muddy waters it was, it was the debate muddy waters and i forget the other miles Davis. Legend. oh it could have been yeah, yeah yeah it was pretty spirited debate yeah so yeah yeah. yeah. And that's the cool thing about Rico. He saw all of them, man. Yeah, Rico saw all of them from Sly Stone, uh, Jimi Hendrix. He saw all of these people in concert, man. Miles yeah. Davis. I, I, I was like, when we'd be on the road, I used to just question him, man. Like, who, who you know, did you see such and such? And he started telling me stories. Yeah, I saw them. He saw Sly Stone. And like, what? And, and, you, and he loved the blues. He loved the blues. So it was like, Mind blowing that he listened to all the, all these other people and then got to see him in concert. You know, I had a chance to see Sly Stone. This is when he was solo. Bobby Womack was on the bill and so think, but he was late and I didn't have the patience to stick around, so I bolted. So yeah, I don't know if he showed up or you know what shape he was in at the time. But man, yeah. the closest the closest I got to that was I was in Europe at the North Sea Jazz Festival. And Larry Graham, Larry Graham was playing. Yeah, yeah. And we had actually hung out prior to that in Paris. And I got to hang out with him, you know, because over there at that time, you know, wasn't too many people speaking English, you know, and then you found some musicians. We all just kind of hung together, you know. And yeah. he allowed me in the circle, man. And uh, we got to North Sea, man. I was on the side of the stage. Larry had those people, man, bouncing up and down, man. And yeah. you had he had, you could it was, I could feel it in my stomach, man. Like whoa, the energy, man. And I'm standing on the side, man, with Marcus Miller and Lenny White, Kev Mo. It was star studded on the side. And he just said he told us all, "Come on out, come on out." <laughs> and we all got up on stage with Larry, man, and he had us jumping up and down, man. And um, I was like, wow, this is the guy that played with Sly Stone, man. And I could feel the impact that he had with the audience and the music, the power he had in that music. I could feel the I could feel all of that. And I could see why Sly Stone and, and all of them were so impactful, man, because it, it's it's a soulful, some soulful cats, man. Yeah, and he he he's been on the show a couple of times. He told me that. He's only been away from his wife like one or two days and the whole time they knew each other. She she's always with the tambourine on the steel part. He saw her on stage, right? Yeah. She yeah. she she was there, man. He he had us all pray with him. They were right, all right. prayed together. We all prayed together before the show. Yeah, yeah. He's Jehovah's yeah. Witness. Yeah. Yeah. So that you mentioned Jelly Bean, Jelly Bean Johnson, uh yeah. drummer with the time and guitarist uh on his own right, the Jelly Bean Johnson experience. You guys are 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 soulmates, brothers, and you've worked together and Tell us about the connection, you guys. First, people that don't know how you guys became affiliated, and you know, to this day. 
You guys are going strong. Man, it's been over 30 years I've been knowing Bean now, man. Uh, we hit it off immediately, man. Um, I met Jelly Bean. This is how it happened. I was on tour with my dad. I was playing with my dad behind um, Coco Taylor, Junior Wells, and my dad. We were the Alligator All-Stars. This was back in 93, mm -hmm. and uh, we were touring with B.B. King. It was the B.B. King Blues Festival, and we were touring all over the United States with uh, B.B. as the, the, the closed the show with uh, Eric Johnson. He, he was uh, part of the show, and then Buddy Guy, and then us, Coco Taylor, Julia Wells, and Lonnie Brooks. And we played up in Minnesota at the, the State Fair at the, in Minneapolis, and Bean was there. I didn't okay. know. Okay. I didn't know Bean at the time. And uh, I didn't know he was there. He was in the audience. And um, so fast forward, we, we had a week off or something like that. And we was here in Chicago. And I was just hanging out in Chicago, man, on the north side. It's, it's this club they used to have called Blues on Halstead. And then across, directly across the street is the Kingston Mines, a famous blues club. And two okay. famous blues clubs, like right next door to each other. I mean, you know, across the street from each other. So I'm at Blues, and uh, somebody said, Albert Collins is down at, at the mines. I'm like, what? <laughs> I love Albert, you know? Right. So I run down to see Albert. A.C. Reed was playing, and I walked in the door. Albert was watching A.C. play, and I walked in the door. Jelly Bean was sitting there, and Jelly Bean was 6'4", six, 6'5". Six, and wears he a just, hat a lot of time. Yeah, and make him look like he's seven foot, you know? Right. And he just stood up right before I got in and said, hey, you Ronnie Baker Brooks? I said, yeah, Jelly Bean Johnson. And to be honest with you, Joe, I was so caught up in seeing Albert Collins, <laughs> it didn't even ring Jelly Bean Johnson. I'm thinking, because he was so big and he had on a uh, Vikings, Minnesota Vikings jersey. I'm thinking he a football player. <laughs> and, and man, and I, I collect myself, oh, he said, man, I just saw you. Wasn't y'all just up in Minnesota? I said, yeah, man, yeah. And and it, did, and it started clicking. This is Jelly Bean, you know, I, yeah, from the time, right. you know. And, man, we, we hit it off, man. And we exchanged phone numbers. And, like, during that break of that tour, we played the fine line up there in, in Minneapolis. Mm -hmm. And I invited Bean to come down, and he came down. He met my dad, and man, we just hit it off immediately, man. I would come back up there and go hang out with Bean. He, we go hit the, you know, all the clubs, and and um, we became like brothers, man. Right. You know, we would go jam together, and and uh, it it came down to me getting ready to do a record, and uh, I just called Bean the vent about it, like, man, I'm trying to get this record done, man. And I was just I was running to obstacles, you know, and he said. Uh, Hey, bro, give me a ticket down there. I'll come help you to Memphis. You know, give me a ticket to Memphis. I'll come down and help you. I'm like, what? He said, yeah, I I'll produce it. I'm like, you kidding me? Now, I didn't know at the time, Bean had never produced the blues record. Mm. It was all R&B or rock, you know, what he did, right. you know. But I go to his house prior to that. He got damn near more blues records than I had, man. <laughs> <laughs> And I don't forget I'll be at his crib bed. I'm blasting some Albert King early in the morning. And I'm like, oh, let me turn it down. He's like, no, turn it back up. Turn it back up. <laughs> or we listening to John Lee Hooker while we eating breakfast, you know. And our relationship built, man. And when we went down to Memphis to look at studios, quick story. Uh, we were looking at studios and we went to my friend's studio. Uh, Nico Lyris had a studio called uh, Cotton Row. Okay. And in that studio, 3-6 Mafia was recording out of at the time mm -hmm. and they were they were building they were hot but they were getting like to that level where they were getting ready to win that oscar you know and we go in there man me and Bean go in there to look at the studio before when we got there it was all these expensive cars parked in the front <laughs> like like bentley's and yeah you know maybox and trucks and i like oh somebody big in here you know yeah. We go in the door, man, and, and Nico's like, look, man, when you come here, I'm going to lock this down. It's normally like, like he's thinking I'm a blues guy, you know, I'm going to be a little offended by these rappers in there. With We walked in the studio, man, it was weed so thick, Joe, you couldn't even see yourself. <laughs> <man>. <laughs> yeah, it was like a P-Funk uh, 
yeah. recording session. Yeah. But the vibe was thick, man. They were in there creating, man. And soon we walked in, they was like, you remember that song, Hit a Mother? Yeah. That they had? Yeah. yeah. They, were, they were cutting that. Put that Hit a Mother. I, I don't know if I could say the words on this show. Yeah. But it's or do it as our Kamala Harris say, M, uh, and it doesn't end with E-R. Yeah, <laughs> she said that's hit a favorite. Him MF. Yeah, yeah. There you go. Hit him, hit, put that, uh, hit him, MF up. You know, and uh, man, they put that song. He said, "Put it up for Jelly Bean, man," because they knew Jelly Bean. They knew they didn't know me too well, but they knew Jelly Bean. Right. And me and Bean was looking at each other like, "Whoa!" He said, "Man, this is crazy, but it's a great studio." And that's when it started, man. Me and Bean worked our butts off, man. Sometimes we'd be in the studio 24 hours, man. Yeah, and, and, and you worked together with other Minnesota crew, you know, Michael Bland, Sonny T, Chance Howard. Yeah. With Jelly Bean. That, that must have been a cool recording session, right? That all stemmed from Bean. Yeah. Um, we did the Gold Digger CD down in Memphis with Steve Potts uh, on drums, Dave Smith on bass. And then uh, Ernest Williamson on keyboards. And, and Bean helped me out on some guitars, and I did some guitars, most of the guitar, all of them, all the guitars. Bean helped me on some. So for the Take Me With You record, Bean's like, hey, bro, we're going to do something a little different. I said, what What you talking about? He said, well, we're going to do the Memphis stuff, but I got something. And I, he didn't tell me. So we do the Memphis, we do the Memphis stuff. He said, man, I... Uh, Set up. I set up a, a session here in, in Minneapolis with Sonny and Michael Bland and Chance. I was like, "What?" <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I went up to uh, Minnesota, man, and, and we cut we cut about five or six tracks up there with them, man. I'll never forget. Mick Condition was coming in the studio checking us out while we were cutting, and uh, it was just a cool vibe, man. And Sonny and Michael B was awesome, man, and they were they were like so cool to me, like. Ronnie, we should take this on the road, man. You know, at that time, they wanted to go on the road as a three-piece. And, and being, you know, a four-piece with being as a special right, guest, yeah. you know. Yeah. I was like, ah. You know, if I had what I have now with the backing of Alligator Records, I would do it. But at the time, I didn't have no help. I was just trying to do it all by myself. Yeah. And, and, and you know, when you bring out Michael and Sonny, it's got to be that level. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. Um, you got a business decision, too, right? Yeah. 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 So, but that was an honor to work with them. And then we did it again on the Torch album. And the cool thing about being introduced to those cats, man, they all come from the blues. But of course, they do what they do, what they're known for. Mm -hmm. um, but they, they got that blues root in them, man, all of them, you know. And even Terry Lewis and Jimmy, Jimmy Jam, they got that blues root in them. And you, you played on one of the tracks with... Uh... The time that hasn't been released, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, oh, the cowboy or cowgirl, cowgirl. Okay, yeah. yeah. Maybe one day. <laughs> one day, hopefully, man. Uh, Larry Graham's on that track. I believe Prince is on the track. Uh, Terry is on. Uh, I think no, Terry didn't play as Larry. Um, I think Beans on drums. I'm not sure. I forget. But I know I played and Prince. I believe Prince is on rhythm right. guitar too. So I know you've told the story on, on my radio show, but to the YouTube audience and everything, you had a connection hanging out with Prince at Paisley Park um, yeah. a little while back, which is pretty cool. Yeah. What, what was that about? Man, that, well, that was uh, actually during that same time being, see what he told me. It's like being always, was, you know, hold his cards real close to his chest <laughs> or something. Because I was young, you know, I was young and, he, you know, and they they they're famous, man. You know, right. you got to, you got to protect that. You know, and um, it, he called me up. They said, "Man, Prince is doing this this celebration at Paisley. You should come on up." I was like, "Cool." So I I went up there, not knowing that he had set up this session with with Terry Lewis at Terry Lewis' house. Oh, okay. And so that's when that's when I did uh, Cowgirl. Right, right. So we we cut the, we cut the, two days. I went there first day. And uh, hung out at Terry's house and talking, you know, getting to know Terry a little better. And then the second day, uh, I came back and he. Oh, your audio I, dropped out. There I, you go. Yeah. I, I, I had cut the track um, that day before. And Terry asked me just to come back just to make sure we got it, you know. 
-hmm. And I came back the next day. He was like, man, I don't know what you did to this track, Ronnie. But I could not let it go all night. I've been working on it all night, man. And he, I was like, come on, Terry. You don't, don't, you know. But being like, no, he's not. He's not playing. <laughs> Terry's serious. <laughs> Terry's very serious. <laughs> and so we ended up that night going to see Prince. And um, at the, the celebration, man, it was George Clinton. Uh, Erica Badu was, was performing that night with Common, the rapper Common. Uh, man, some of everybody, man, was there. And um, Prince said, hey, man, after the show, we was at the sound booth. He, he came to the sound booth, said, hey, man, y'all come to the studio after the, after the set, you know. And he walked away. And I said, Bean, did he mean me too? <laughs> he, said, <laughs> he said, he said, y'all. Right, <laughs> right. I ended up going to the, the studio, you know, was inside of the building, but a different part of the building. Mm -hmm. And man, I was quiet as a church mouth, Joe. I was like, man, I'm not saying nothing. I don't want to get kicked out of it. And I remember me, we all get there, and, and Terry had us uh, do some chanting on this track he was doing for Morris. Morris was there, and um, we were doing this chant. And um, and Terry said, hey, why don't y'all go out there and get, get some girls? I need some girls to do some chant, chanting, you know, on this record some oohs and ahs or whatever it was. Right. And, and uh, right when the girls came in, Prince came in. And he started preaching. What are you doing, Terry? What are you doing, Morris? He said, oh, we're just getting some chants, man. Why do you want to do that to the sisters? Now, they wasn't doing anything bad. It was just like, ooh, right. ah, you know what, nothing provocative or nothing, you know, bad at all. But I think Prince used this situation to try to connect and get them to convert to Jehovah Witness. Mm. And that started a whole conversation that night. We ended up there to like eight in the morning, man. Prince held court. Now we ended up on the floor of the studio. I never forget this. Prince is on the piano talking. He's trying to get Terry and Morris, Jelly Bean and Jerome. Everybody was there to convert to Jehovah Witness. And they were like, man, we're not ready for that. You, you there, man, but we're not, you, can, you know, and you know, I can understand both sides, you know? Yeah, yeah. And and um, he was playing this beautiful melody on the p piano, man, while he was talking, and he'd get up and he'd say something, and, and he just threw out the question. What's the ultimate goal in life? What do you what do you want to do? What's your ultimate goal? And when he, you know, we were talking about music, I wouldn't say a word. But when he started talking about faith, mm -hmm. now we're equal. Right, right. We're equal now in God's eye. In my God's eye, we're equal. And I said, man, I don't know where I got the courage from, Joe. Because I just said, hey, man, ultimately, I want to be the best person I could be. I want to be better than I was yesterday. Prince got up out of his chair, man, got on the floor. And I'm sitting next to me and Tori Ruffin sitting next to <laughs> yeah, Tori, cool. Tori, my brother, man. Tori, I guess I can say this now. I didn't say it before. I can say it now. God rest Prince soul. But you know, he didn't allow no alcohol or nothing. In yeah, him. yeah, right. So <laughs> I think Tori, Tori told the story. Oh, no, go did. ahead. Maybe so, if it's just you tell it. Yeah. Okay. So me and Tori sit next to each other. We, you know, we whispering and, and Prince talking over there. We just, yeah, man, man. I'm trying to listen, man. And all of a sudden, Tori, he had a flask in his jacket and it fell on the floor. Boom! It made the noise. And we all looking. And he grabbed it real quick before Prince could see it. <laughs> like if your dad walks in. <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah. And he, you think he saw it, man? But Prince kept on talking like as if he didn't see it, man. But me and Tori was crying, laughing, man. We were crying, laughing, like, man. You're going to get us kicked out of here, man. <laughs> so, you know, and then after that, Prince came and sat down next to me, man, when I said what I said, and uh, he's talking. And I, I'm like, whoa. Like, I'm into it with him. We're talking back and forth. And then all of a sudden, Joe, I just looked down at his boots. He had on some bad boots, man, really nice, sharp boots, custom look like, mm -hmm. with a heel on it. Right. And then it just hit me. This is Prince. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this is the modern-day Jimi Hendrix. This is... 
Prince. That's right, yeah. And I went back into, shut up. <laughs> right, yeah. It's like, whoa. <laughs> yeah, but it was a right great night, man. We we were there all day, man. And then after he, most of the people left, and it was just Terry, Jelly Bean, and Morris, and, and um, most of the time, you know, the band. And me, he mm-hmm. really got uh, uncandid. And that's the side I saw Prince that uh, – uh, I was fortunate to see because he was just, when he was around them, it was like brothers. They were like brothers. It wasn't this, I'm a star thing or this thing. He he let that down, that guard down and, and just like one of the fellas, man. He took us around showing us Paisley, man. And he showed me the, the uh, triple diamond of Purple Rain. I had never seen a diamond record. Mm-hmm. And he had a triple diamond record. And he was like, yeah. I'm like, man, that's cool. And he showed me his, his uh, Batman piano and uh, just showed us around, man. We, we just walked around talking, man. And it was just a beautiful day for me, man. I'll never forget. Yeah. I mean, that that's a definitely a relatable story to, that nobody sees. Not the few. Yeah. You're one of the few that, to get to I, I, I was hang. blessed. Yeah, yeah. That was because of Jelly Bean, man. You know, and, and uh, Jelly Bean, I knew he knew about me, but I would always say, Ben, you think he remember? He said, Yeah, he, he remember you, man. Right. If he, he might not know your name, but he know you my but my brother, you know, he know me and you. Right. And 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 fast forward, man, uh, it was a time when him and Bean kind of fell out. And um, you know, because at that time the time was trying to do a record mm-hmm. and Prince yeah. wouldn't let him use the name or whatever. Yeah, original that, seven, yeah. That have frustrated being a lot because he was he he was doing the family too with with Paul and them, Paul Peterson and them, and they wouldn't let them use that name. And Bean was getting frustrated, and Bean was just going off in the in the press about it a little bit. And I, and I, yeah. I would I call Bean like, "Hey man, cool out, Bean. You know, babe, bro, I'm tired. I'm tired of this. You know." And Jerome called me. Jerome called me one morning. He said, "Man, Prince told me to call you." I said, what? He said, yeah, Prince told me to call. He said, what for what? And he said, why don't you talk with Bing, man? He said, he wants you to talk with Bing because Bing wouldn't respond back to Prince at that time or whatever. And uh, I said, man, I can't talk to Bing. If y'all, y'all could talk to him, he said, no, you, you and Bing really tight. You know, he think Bing might listen to you. So I, I used to tell Bing, man, just, you know, that's that's y'all, y'all brothers. You keep that family stuff in inside, you know. And, uh, but eventually, Unfortunately, uh, mm-hmm. Pr- Prince passed away, and uh, Bean called me to confirm that. Man, and I know that broke his heart yeah. because uh, Prince was reaching out to Bean. Mm-hmm. He was trying to reach out to Bean, and Bean was so hurt or mad. He was kind of like, and you know, I understand both sides, man. I just tried to be a mediator and let my brother being understand a different side i know because I, I can't walk in his shoes mm-hmm. but i can also look at it as a different lens than him and say hey man because i i kind of come up with my father and my father was always a problem solver you know and he always say you don't uh argue with someone when you're emotional when you're emotional because you you know you uh, might yeah, say that's a good point <clears throat> and do some things that you don't mean. You might say something that you don't really mean. I know Bing said some things that he really didn't mean because he loves Prince. Right, right. Yeah, he, you know, the last time we hung out with the time in Connecticut it was after the show in a hotel room that had a couple of adjoining rooms. And mm-hmm. it was after, right after Prince passed away. And it's the first time I've ever heard Morris Day speak in a regular Morris Day. His speaking voice, his regular voice, yeah. and then the character. And he, you know, he, he was, they were all, affected by it but yeah yeah i remember seeing morris after it happened and he was just you could tell he was just numb man he was numb he was like they did a show here he was so kind of like you could i know but when he hit the stage you couldn't see it you know but before the stage you could see it it's this all over him man they 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 were hurting they they were brothers man i mean you know anytime you're making history like they did and Mm -hmm. they do right it's some good, bad, and ugly, man. But the one thing I can say about all of them, yeah, they, they brothers, man. They love each other. They fight. Yeah. I fight with my own brother. Right, right. <laughs> yeah. It happens. I got, I got six. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so yeah, but the, they made some incredible music, and I was just thinking about this the other day. They got the hook in America's belly 
with some of them songs, man. All them songs they did that time of the of, of, of that time. Yeah, they were it. Yeah, it's like the Minneapolis song. You got the P Funk. You got Motown. You got Chicago Blues. Yeah. But it's funny from from being asking questions and being around musicians. You ask, what was it like knowing you made great music like that and the the effect it was on people. I swear, everyone who was involved in a big movement like that, I was like, I don't know. We were just making music, yeah, like being creative. They they weren't thinking about like, hey, this is good. we're gonna make our money. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So no expectation, just doing it for the love, and and, and right. you know, you want to do something with your life, man. Uh, I remember someone asked Morris, <laughs> we were somewhere. I was hanging out with them somewhere, and somebody asked Morris, Morris, what would you do if you wasn't a musician? He said, I'd probably be a vagrant. <laughs> 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 and I was like, you know what? That's probably of most of us. <laughs> yeah, but he'd be dressed to the nine still. He'd have his old clothes on, his stage clothes. <laughs> yeah, you Stacey know, Adams. Man, because yeah. you you dedicate your life to this man, and um, you know you they made some incredible. I mean, look at all the people they inspired, man. Look at the disciples from that, man. Look at the tree from mm -hmm. that. What they've right. done, man. And even today, you can hear. The, the music, the inspiration, and the, the young people that's coming up now, you know. Right. So we, we got to jump back into ah. your record. You yeah. Know, I got a little detour, but that, that was great talking about Jelly Bean and, and Prince and everybody like that. But um, Blues in My DNA, Alligator Records, October 11th, all the dates on your website going out on the road. And and speaking of Coke with Montoya, you, right before the pandemic, you guys were doing some dates, right? Yeah. Did yeah, you man, play, we, did you play Connecticut Fairfield? I know you were scheduled. We did. Oh, okay. We did. We that yeah. was after though. That was after when we things started. No, no. Yeah, it was after. Wait a minute. I gotta think about it now, man. It was after the pandemic. Okay. Yeah. It was after. The, it was right when they started opening up things, and we still wasn't really open like it is. It's still not really open, but I mean, we still got the effects of the pandemic, but it's much better than it was then, and we were doing some dates together. But what it was. We were doing a tribute tour to Albert Collins. Oh, okay, yeah. And we got two dates in, man. Excuse me. And we were headed up to Minneapolis. And um, the word started getting around, man, about they closing down. When when I saw them shut down the NBA, mm -hmm. when the NBA shut down the basketball NBA, yeah, I was like. Yeah, we're, we're then, next. <laughs> yeah, and then I saw Buddy Guy cancel dates. I was like, oh, that's it. That's it. Yeah. And, and uh, I got the call out because I was calling Bean. Like, Bean, we coming up there, man. And and we was in sound check. We had a show here. We had played Milwaukee and then here. And we were headed to Minneapolis the next night. And uh, Bean was calling. He called me doing sound checks. Say, Big Brother, they canceled your show. I didn't even know. Mm. And I guess it got out up there that it was canceled, and they and it's being called Bay Road to cancel your show, man. And I had to call my manager. My manager didn't even know. Wow. Being knew before yeah. my manager, <laughs> and after that, everything shut down, man. Yeah. Well, we. Oops. Sorry about that. <laughs> yeah. But it, but yeah, we're we're in present time. You got a great record. You know, we've heard the whole thing. You know, we thanks Alligator to dropping us in advance. And um, before I run out of juice on the computer here, uh, I got to ask you to talk about your band. I mean, you got Daryl Coots still rolling with you. Who, your rhythm section. Tell us about the uh, the other guys in the band. Daryl Coots still with me on keyboards. Um, mm -hmm. I got a young kid. Well, he's not. He's young, but young, young to me. But he's been with me about four or five. Well, about four years now since the pandemic. Uh, Chris Singleton is on drums. Okay. Um, and then my man Phil Castleberry on bass. Phil is a well-known bassist here in Chicago. He, he come up a little bit before Daryl Munch Jones has played with the Stones. Right. Um, Phil used to play with the OJs. Uh -huh. uh, he he played with some of everybody, man. Um, I got him on bass, and uh, we just hitting the road, man. We actually in rehearsal this week, and uh, got rehearsal next uh, coming up next week, and getting ready for the tour. So how how many off the top of your head do you do you know how many artists are on Alligator? Because you played with so many on tour, right? Yeah, I, I know my sister Shamika Copeland, who's the the whole record's of, uh, coming out. Yeah, yeah, hers her album's out now. It's okay. called uh, "Blame It on Eve" on Alligator. 
my, my man Coco Montoya, he, he's got an album out called Writing on the Wall. My Nick man Moss. Tommy, yeah. Nick Moss is from Chicago. He's got a yeah. record out. Uh, Taranzo Cannon got a record out. Uh, Tommy Castro got yeah. a record coming. Um, my man Billy Branch is working on the record right now. So um, we here, man. You know, it's changed, Joe, from back in the day with my dad and Coco Taylor and Albert Collins and Sun Seals and Lil Ed's still around. Lil Ed's still here. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But uh, he's still on Alligator. But uh, it's changing now. It's another another yeah. family coming up with the blues, our generation, you know. Well, you, you pushed Reset and, you know, the, yeah. thanks for keeping us in the pandemic with those jams, especially the one with Jelly Bean at your house. Yeah. That was, that was really cool. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so. Yeah. One, one final question I'm, I want to ask you because you're notorious for going out in the crowd and playing live walking through the crowd. People love that. Any mishaps ever happened while you were out there? Yes. <laughs> and you can I say it on the air? <laughs> I can say it on the air. I, I'm, it happened at the club. I'm having my CD release party at on the 18th of October at Fitzgerald's. i never forget this. I go out in the audience and I knew, normally have my man with me. Uh, it was Back in the day, it was Rico, but now it's, it's Scooter or my man Luther. I got my man Luther with me now. They'll go out with me. With, you know, Luke, uh, Rico started that with the flashlight thing. He would bring the flashlight out with me when I walk out. You know, right, people right. can see me. He put the light right on me. Be so bright sometimes I can't see where I'm going. <laughs> so my man, this it was Scooter. I go out in the audience, man, and this lady, this was before I was married. This lady came up to me, you know, and I'm, I'm playing to her, you know, and she just grabbed me, man, put her face all in my chest. I'm sweating. <laughs> Right. Put her face all in my chest and then bite my chest, man. <laughs> Joe, I wanted to hit her with my guitar, man, because it hurt me. I was, you know, reacting to the pain. Right, right. Like, what are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> you, man, that's one of them, man. But most of all, it's been a, a great experience going out in the audience. It's my way of connecting with them and making them feel a part of the show and making me feel a part of them, you know, because right. I'm a fan too. So, yeah, you're an amazing performer. YouTube videos all over there through the years. You can go back as far as 15 years, you can see Ronnie performing, performing with his dad, Jelly Bean. And you yeah. know this guy when he comes to your town or you could travel a little bit. Definitely well yeah. worth going to see Ronnie Baker Brooks. Yeah. Yeah. And the new record. Get it, get it, get it. Yeah, oh, you, you can got order it, right it now. You can, you can pre-order it now. Okay. This is the album. It's going to be on a blue vinyl, man. I, I hope I got time to show you real quick. Yeah, yeah. It's on out. It's on vinyl. And then I got it, of course, on all of the uh, the platforms. Wow, that's neat. Blues in my DNA. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> that's the and, perks. Uh, yeah, that's the perks of being with Alligator, right? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, you know, they got, you know, a machine there, man, that's got a history. And, uh, you know, I, I, I'm proud to say my father helped build, mm -hmm. and hopefully I can add to it. Exactly. So, hey, I'm going to I'm gonna bid our audience adieu, and thanks, Ronnie, for coming on the show. Your brother for life, and always nice to have you on. Thank you, and, brother. Uh, Thank you for all you do for the music and the musicians, man. Got to try. We got to try. We're working together. So hope to see you on the East Coast. I'm sure you'll be adding more dates as well. So Yes, sir. Thank you, Ronnie. Thank you. Kind of loving I need. That's right. I'm feeling you. I'm feeling you. Girl, I'm feeling you.